today we're going to talk a bit about uh, fault tolerance. Actually, this is not something that valid only for Java. Everyone who faces the design, I mean, not software design, overall design, overall implementation, every, everything in our world that made by people, in some case, have to be, uh, have to deal with these kind of things that is fault tolerance. And actually, so let's start probably with uh, trivial things. And I would like to start with, as usual, with the definition. So actually what the fault tolerance is. So the fault tolerance actually is the property of any system. It includes not only software, and it, it always includes it as well includes the hardware, for example. Uh, and what the tolerant, uh, what actually this property is about? It allows to uh, our system or our component to operate in properly in case of some issues. So, for example, if something happened to it it still operates correctly. What, is, what mean actually operates properly? Uh, definitely this means that it, first of all, uh, continues to, uh, uh, continues to deliver its business functions. So it continues functionings and do whatever uh, it needs to do based on what it has been created for. Uh, and actually, this means that uh, some failures, not obviously the all failures, uh, can uh, will uh, not gain any kind of harm to our system. Uh, Actually, I think that uh, you probably know that all this fault happens here and there all the time and things like that. Uh, so, and actually this thing is important for us, but uh, I would like to say here uh, one thing that is not that obvious. So actually, usually, and in the most cases, uh, this fault tolerance not come uh, for free. Uh, and I think that you will agree with this and later we will see uh, the, uh, this in the details, but actually this not comes for free. And wh what actually this means that this is always a kind of compromise between uh, how our system should be fault tolerant and what we can achieve of that. Yes, so I think uh, that this is, uh, really uh, kind of really obvious about this. So uh, what, what I mean, for example, let's take some example. Why don't we have all our systems super fault tolerance and never fall back and never, and never crash and things like that? Actually, because of it would be really, really, really expensive. Uh, for example, let's take some kind of uh, very complex machines like aircrafts or ships. All of them are designed uh, to be very fault tolerant, spacecrafts as well. And actually, mainly because of these reasons, these things, uh, they first of all they are designed within years or even decades. Uh, they all have, I don't know, like the, the cost of its design and its implementation is really really high, like hundreds of millions of dollars and things like that. Uh, and mainly this is because they very very concentrate on uh, to be to tolerate all the faults, to resist all the faults and things like that. So uh, before, <laughs> actually, my uh, kind of advice to you, if you, uh, if you, <clears throat> if you agree with it, so my kind of advice would be first, be before you are doing some kind of this action and design your system to be a fault tolerant, ask yourself, is it worth to be? Uh, is it worth to be? Is it actually required? how cost it may take to you to not only to design or to implement, uh, to support these things, to maintain these things and things like that. Because all of this is, as I mentioned earlier, not comes for free. And uh, now let's dive a bit into our actually topic and carry on. Uh, so first of all, as I already mentioned, uh, before you start to make your system full 
fully <laughs> fault tolerant, uh, what you what would you need to consider? Uh, before, because of uh, all this, as I mentioned, it's all about uh, it's all comes with its price and it's not free. So first of all, uh, the, uh, the kind of algorithm or advisors are first of all to understand how your component or your, uh, or your system critical is. So if, for example, this system, uh, let's say, is not very critical, I don't know, like for, I can imagine, for example, like printing reports for some cases, because some reports are really critical, but let's imagine that this can be some kind of secondary tasks, maybe a report, maybe it can be, I don't know, like uh, just uh, measuring how, for example, people use it, or I don't know, things like that. Uh, so you have to consider it. So for example, let's take an example, the assistant that creates a report for, uh, for our, let's say, internet shop. This report can be generated at any time and there is nothing cru crucial about uh, when exactly it will appear in our or in 10 hours or even in two days. So nothing critical about it. So uh, shall we actually put all effort of all our team or all, or few teams to make this report system as fault tolerate? I think that it is not worth. Another thing to consider is what the probability of uh, component or system to fail. Uh, definitely everything can, uh, can go wrong, but there are some systems that are designed to be like resilient or designed to be resistant by itself from the start. And for example, if we talk about clouds, yes, so the, the services that are provided by cloud providers, I mean, for example, by Amazon or maybe by Google, they, for example, are designed to be the designed to be a fault tolerance. They have a very high availability and all these things like that. So maybe uh, this, so we also need to consider this uh, while we are thinking about our fault tolerance. For example, let's take uh, as an example, uh, like I was working with Google Cloud a lot, so maybe, uh, and uh, it's uh, like, it's storage, yes. Uh, it uh, its availability is in like five nines, yes. So it's 99%, uh, like 1999, like thousands of, Only yes, we can, but this is very unlikely to happen. Very, very unlikely to happen. Uh, and uh, so you should consider things like that when you are trying to make your system uh, to be a fault tolerance. Uh, and the, I, I'd say the last, but definitely not the least, is a, pri a price which, would, uh, which you should pay. Uh, by price, I mean, it's not only about money, it's about effort to implement. It's about effort for maintenance. It's about actually the price. If you, for example, need to buy some tools or some service or things like that, it's all, all of these things actually can be considered as a price. And uh, so, so first of, uh, so, and this is, Actually, as I maybe too much said today already, but this is things that have to be considered every time when you are talking about the fault tolerance. Uh, yeah, because you can easily just run out of money and we will see this in future. Okay. Uh, so carry on. Uh, and uh, so the next step actually, after, after we understand uh, which of components of our system or which some systems have to be uh, have to have to resist our faults, uh, what we shall think about uh, to make them so uh, to make this them tolerant to any faults. The first, the first of all, uh, I would recommend you to concentrate about the data because actually. Uh, 
all our IT actually, it is about the data. I think maybe you have thought on this or no, but uh, the data is the core uh, of all this IT industry. And uh, the thing that may happen, for example, the data loss or the data corruption, actually they, uh, in many things, in many, uh, I don't know, like maybe 95% of case, uh, this is something that is definitely not acceptable. And when you designing your system as a fault tolerance, uh, the first thing you should think of is about the data because when you lost this data, you would actually, you, will, you would never be able to restore it. And such a data that cannot be restored is the main thing you should care about. What would happen with it? Uh, how you would deal that this data will not lose? Or for example, if this data is lost, how you will restore it and things like that. Uh, and another thing about data um, that we need to think about is uh, the data that cannot be accessed within a required time. By this, what I mean, let's imagine that you have a traditional system with a database, with your business logic on some or on uh, one service or several services and UI, and uh, I don't know, you're doing some things. And uh, as, as being a really following the really best practices, you making the backups of your database. And actually this is really good that you have a backups, but when database fa fails, yes, you understand that you have a backup, but your system is not functioning at the time. So you will need to stop everything, uh, restore your backup, uh, that, uh, backup and then uh, restart and proceed to working. And uh, this is something that is also really important, not for all systems, but some, uh, for some kind of systems that cannot be, let's say, uh, that cannot uh, tolerate this uh, uh, downtimes. Yes, um, I don't know, like medical applications, aircraft applications and things like that they will uh, they are not uh, they not designed it and they require it to be always uptime and this kind of things for them unacceptable and actually this means that we need to think of some kind of another solution okay and another thing is to concentrate is and actually I, on, based on my practice, I, especially in the era of microservices, yes, I, I know that many people say, oh yes, nothing wrong with happens and things like that, but actually uh, it appeared not to be so. And the thing, uh, and the thing to concentrate on is uh, how your system will proceed operating if it's part or some external components are become unreachable, they stop to respond and uh, things like that. Um, actually, this, is, uh, this may be easy to, easy to answer a question for the first time, but actually it is not so. And uh, in future we will see that, not in future, but later here we will see how to deal with, but actually, yes. Let's imagine that you have a user service, you have like a card service in your internet shop and user service uh, disappears. Like actually, what does this mean? How the card service would behave? All this, uh, actually all these uh, questions have to be answered ideally before something wrong happens. And another thing to, about this is that your uh, active service needs to, let's say, gracefully behave when uh, such crashes happens. Uh, the one thing also about this is that some systems, uh, they uh, usually people try to avoid, but there is things like, which called the single point of failure. And this single point of failure means that your system can entirely crash when one of its component is down. Um, 
actually, I think that you know about this in theory, but uh, for example, in practice, uh, let's imagine the system that are really like modern now uh, and uh, are designed, for example, around Kafka or around any other things like that, uh, for example, and are, let's say, reactive or even based. And this, uh, and for example, if your, uh, if your queue or whatever uh, this uh, event processing machine is down, yes, actually this means that all of your components suddenly in one minute becomes really, really isolated and actually none of each can work. Uh, Actually, there, definitely there is few things that providers of uh, such solutions are making for make them uh, much more sustainable in this case. But anyway, you should think yourself. You should think about how would you deal with uh, such a things. Uh, another thing that, for example, uh, recently happened with Facebook, if you, I don't know if you have followed this, uh, that, for example, sorry, that Facebook disappeared for a day or so, I not, I'm not, don't know exactly for how long, but uh, the thing there was that they had issue with their DNS, uh, sir, with their DNS records or things like that. And it actually means that all of Facebook is disappeared. Uh, and actually this is about uh, this single point of failure. It can be anywhere. And when you are designing your system, you should be ideally, ideally you should uh, think about uh, what this single point can be. And it can be any, any of your components. Yes, uh, another aspect to consider is uh, is about how your system uh, uh, regarding your system performance so how it will affect it for example if some of its services and or some or, or some of its part disappear uh, how it would affect all the system imagine 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 that we have for example uh, the system with the database and this database is uh, have several instances yes but the primary instance is let's say powerful and the secondary instance uh, we decided to save some money and make it less powerful yes apparently the primary instance fails and all the application move to secondary index and uh, Actually, this uh, instance and this instance just like, I don't know, it doesn't cope with such amount of requests, such amount of operations and things like that. And actually, since this is the, let's say, core component where everybody is talking to it, actually, this means that all our system becomes really slow. And this is another aspect of uh, how of uh, failures then ca that can happen to your system because for some reason uh, the system can work or correctly if it works slowly but for some it is not acceptable at all and in this case this is something that worth to consider and another case that mentioned not so often in literature or in internet, but it is not less important. And I actually, I think that this even more important is uh, system security degradation. For example, uh, let's imagine that we have only one service that ask user for login. Yes, and it fails. Uh, and actually this means that the rest of the services they are become really insecure, so everybody can do anything with them. Actually, I know that this is a bit childish example, but I hope that you get my point here. And uh, to resist these things, there is uh, such a thing that is called security in depth. 
And this security in depth actually assumes that uh, you're uh, repeating, repeating all your security actions, all this all these checks on every of your component. Maybe not on every, but on every that user can reach or another service can reach. So, and this is something that also really worth to think about when you uh, want to design your system as a fault tolerant. Uh, okay, so after you actually were uh, think of and identified all these important things to think about and to consider when you designing your system, actually the next things you should think of is what actually do with all these things, with all threats that you identified in your system and this is about, and this is what our next session about. Um, okay, so how to uh, resist the faults? Uh, there is few techniques and we will go through maybe some of them which are most popular and uh, see how they deal with it. So the first techniques, and this is really, um, let's say, really popular as it is replication actually uh, based on our picture you can see that uh, let's imagine that uh, we have a server and we call it instance one and uh, in case, and we de decided that it is uh, not sustainable enough for our system. What can we actually do? Uh, the simple thing is that we can actually add another instance, which is uh, which is the same as this one. It is they are kind of very identical. Uh, are I don't know, like they are twins. But the thing here is that, uh, uh, and when user uses this server uh, in a regular way, in a regular way, uh, it contacts with server one, and in case of failure, actually it goes to server two. This is very simple. Uh, our new cloud technologies uh, or cloud technologies, they allow you uh, have many, many variations of uh, this uh, kind of technique. So you can, for example, store your service in different zone. You can store your, what actually would, which actually, what would, what would it bring to you? If you, for example, have them in several zones, when one, one zone is, becomes off, for example, let's say uh, you have users in America and in Europe, uh, your primary, primary audience is in uh, Northern America and your secondary audience is in Europe. And for some reason, the instance from uh, Northern America is down. The old users can go to uh, instance in Europe, for example, for example. Yeah, uh, there can be many variations of this. You can even like double, triple this, but uh, and uh, in this way you will deal uh, with uh, this fault that might happen to your server. Actually, I think that this is really obvious and uh, this is very, let's say, flexible technique that can be combined with different variations and I probably will not uh, focus um, on this uh, too long, and but the uh, but the one thing you always sh have to consider when you use this uh, technique is that you have to uh, synchronize your state between these servers. What actually this means? Uh, let's imagine again. I don't know, like uh, internet shop is my best example because actually it uh, have many kind of. Uh, things that are really easy to understand and are uh, really depictive in this case. But again, sorry for for my for me being repetitive. But we have 
uh, internet shop, uh, we have uh, it runs on instance one. The instance two is kind of our backup instance. Uh, you as a user add something to your cart and then something happened bad and you are switched to your instance two and your actually cart is disappeared. Uh, even worse, uh, you press the checkout button, you gave your credit card example, uh, sorry, your credit card number and all these details, uh, when to, where to deliver your, um, your good, and, uh, but something happened and you redirected to another service and you actually have no idea what actually happened. Will your money be uh, charged from you? Will something be delivered? You are just going to blank server as nothing had happened. And uh, actually this means, uh, actually this situation depicts that you have to synchronize your uh, state when you are trying to use this technique. So uh, you, in, in, he, in this example, you need to think of, of how you can synchronize uh, this server with this server all the time. Actually here I have kind of solution, which is simple, but still works for some cases. For some cases it is not enough, but actually in this case, they use the same database. And if to assume that you have uh, all this state is stored in this database, then actually it works. For some uh, cases when you are not allowed to do so for some reasons, this will not work. And this is something that you should think about if uh, you need to, if you want to use this technique. Uh, what can what can help us actually uh, the usually such as things uh, they can handle they can be handled with help of the load balancing i remind you that you can have your client load balancing you can have your server load balancing uh, here i have provide you with the links to what the sprint provide us since this is i think i suppose the most popular framework nowadays, which is used for Java development. Uh, beside of that, uh, we have tools which, or even uh, subsystems which called API Gateway. Uh, this API Gateway is not only does the load balancing, it actually does many, many additional uh, things uh, to load to load balancing itself, uh, and actually I think you can familiar, but uh, but if you're not, I will provide you, for example, with Zool. This is something. This also the API gateway, which is uh, originally oh sorry 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 created by Netflix. Uh, apologies. Uh, which originally created by Netflix, but now it is a part of Spring Cloud uh, package. Uh, we, if you cannot use this for some reasons, the Nginx also very flexible tool that can be used as a load balance, uh, as a sorry, as API gateway as well. Uh, and there are actually many of them that you can uh, use, and uh, so you can use it and it will bring you this kind of uh, redirects and things like that, okay? So moving forward, uh, another technique. It is actually another technique. It is uh, called recovery shepherd shepherding. Actually, it also can be called as recovery. It also can be called as shepherding. Uh, it also can be uh, can be called as a, a watchdog. All in our case, all of them are synonymous now. And uh, how it actually works? Uh, in this case, we you have a server one, and you have only one instance of that server, and uh, you have an additional component which is called watcher. And what what this uh, watcher actually do? This watcher uh, just uh, <laughs> watches on how your server behaves. 
it uh, takes some of its metrics and it and it, by by these metrics and their combination it evaluates uh, the it evaluates the state of your server. Uh, I, I by state I mean if it's okay, if it's performing okay, is it underloaded, is it overloaded, uh, is it have all its pools and things like that in right condition, buffers, everything. And uh, when something happens uh, in the simplest way, it restarts the server. Uh, and uh, in, let's say, in more complex scenario, it can do some other actions, maybe just flush some buffers, uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, like uh, flash cache, uh, do uh, uh, other additional things, but let's keep it simple. And for example, if this server becomes unavailable for, I don't know, for um, some kind of maybe like thread dumps or anything, it's just restart the service. Or even if server uh, decided to go down by itself, let's say out of memory, this watcher just restarts the service. Uh, what actually it brings to us. Uh, this technique is also simple, uh, probably as simple as the previous one. It's not require uh, many things from, for, for, from us to think about on, on design phase or on implementation phase. We actually can uh, write our server uh, as we write it before. Uh, and this uh, is external things that doesn't affect our code. For example, it doesn't affect our features. And in this case, uh, uh, this is something easy to incorporate, uh, easy to add to our system. Uh, about tools, uh, how you can add this watcher. Uh, so uh, when you uh, have your system as a single process, uh, there is a very popular tool. Uh, it is it called Zmonit. I don't know, it's quite old and probably there are some more modern of this, but uh, I don't know if you guys know, but I haven't faced anything like that. Uh, so and so what this Monit does, uh, this Monit uh, uh, actually it is a application for Linux or for Unix like systems. And uh, when you start your processes, uh, under this monit, actually, it means that this monit tool, it is command light tool, and it starts your processes. After it starts it, it starts to monitor it. It starts to see how it uses memory, how it uses CPU, how it uses disk space, and there are many custom settings you can uh, uh, ask this tool to watch for. And actually in this way, it monitors your process. When your process for some reason goes down or it uh, faces some issue, for example, I don't know, like out of uh, disk out of space or um, out of memory or anything like that, it tries to restart your, uh, it tries to restart uh, your process. And uh, if uh, there is also this monit uh, things they have like on the, uh, they works for one machine and also they can work for several machines. For example, if uh, it can, um, let's say give a command to restart your application on another instance and things like that. So it works in this way. Uh, Actually, when microservices become more and more popular, all of them, uh, I mean, uh, the microservice arch uh, uh, architecture itself assumes that you use this kind of uh, uh, resiliency and uh, this auto scaling and things like that. So uh, these tools becomes uh, really, really uh, widely used. And for distributed applications, yes, in Java, we have tools like Zabbix. It is quite old tool, but it's still, uh, let's say, uh, it's a long time on the market, but it's still actual and it does the jobs really well. And you can, uh, like, let's say, orchestrate many instances and 
in many combination of how you can restart your uh, server, add another instance, uh, remove another instance when you don't need it anymore and things like that. Uh, beside of Zabbix, you also probably know these tools like Prometheus and Dynatrace, which allows you to uh, to manage how your, uh, first of all, how your instances uh, behave, uh, what is their state, uh, what is their metrics, and what to do with them. Uh, beside of that, in addition, in addition to all of this, you can even uh, uh, use this technique you like recovery for your infrastructure and for example kubernetes provide these things uh, the cloud providers like google amazon azure all of them provides for example managed instance group auto scaling and things like that that will allow you to for example um, not to lost your application when it fall down and restart it in case of fault which would make your application really available to end users or to other applications. Um, okay, so shall we move on with our techniques? And another technique I would like you, I would like to mention, but not probably to concentrate on another uh, is uh, cir circuit breaker. Actually, uh, this is pattern that becomes really, really uh, popular when we uh, when we started to write our microservices. And uh, actually, what it brings us, uh, I would like to to say here that, for example, the previous two techniques, what they did, they actually made your system available or uh, made your system, let's say, uh, resilient in any way. And, uh, and they, this is how they dealt with uh, the faults. And these patterns, actually, it completely differs because, first of all, what it does, it isolates our faults. And this is actually really important because, uh, for example, if we have one component of our system fails, uh, this ideally doesn't affect all the system and doesn't cause an entire system to crash. Okay, and uh, so and this pattern it actually help us exactly in this way. So, uh, what it does, how it works, and briefly, uh, let's discuss briefly and and then a bit concentrate on its pros and cons. So actually, it have a few states: uh, the state open, the state closed, and half of open, and when it actually applies. It applies when you trying to contact some external services. Let's not maybe focus on what the server is, service is, but some external to your application uh, service. And uh, uh, this, um, this breaker becomes closed when everything goes fine. So if your calls to external service goes well, actually it uh, remains closed and it does nothing. But what happens uh, uh, when some of your calls start to fail on this external service? When the call failed, it becomes open. Uh, and what actually this means? Uh, this means that your next call to this um, external service with first of all uh, will not happen. So you will not be able to call this service, uh, uh, this uh, uh, external service and uh, what it brings to you. First of all, you have the things which uh, is called uh, fail early. And the second, you can uh, handle this correctly. Let's imagine the situation. Yes, we have two services, uh, service A, service B. Service B is failed for some reason or like under, under maintenance, it doesn't matter. Uh, service A try to call service B. Uh, and what actually happens? It sends a request. It waits, let's say 30 seconds for timeout. 
and then it receives some kind of error. It is, can be IO error, or it can be errors, uh, uh, or it can be errors that network name not found, or anything else. And but to understand that, uh, you like spent all your thirty seconds just for do, just to do this, and this actually affected not really good for your service. So, and in this, uh, comparing to if we have a circuit breaker, what it brings after the first failed call, it will say that service B is unavailable. And after some time, uh, it resets the timeout and becomes a half open. Uh, what actually this means? This means that you, it will wait for, let's say, I don't know, like five minutes, and then it try to call this server, uh, it becomes, this breaker becomes a half often, and it uh, do another attempt to contact this service. If this uh, service is still unavailable, it's uh, again become open, yes, and uh, it will uh, not allow you to call this external service, okay? And uh, yes, and definitely if after this timeout, uh, the call is success, uh the circuit breaker becomes closed and like it works uh again what it gives us it gives us the isolation uh it gives us the uh, fail fast and uh, actually uh, the one another thing is that it uh, uh requires not many coding from us. So yes, you don't have to code ev everything here yourself. Uh, uh, what about its uh, disadvantages? The main disadvantages here is that it actually have limited appliance. Uh, what I mean by this, first of all, that not all services uh, can be, uh, like be, can be used in this way. Uh, for example, uh, let's imagine that you are on, I don't know, like aircraft and there is such uh, and uh, such things that are, they are not applicable here or, or any uh, crucial services or services that have to, uh, that, uh, that actually have to uh, all, um, let's say always deal with uh, mm, always deal with uh, like a, a actually service before uh, like i don't know like even if it fails it still have to be failed uh, so uh, this circuit breaker is can be applied everywhere but uh, for let's say usual reasons you easily can and Actually, I would like to encourage you to use it because it brings many good things to our application. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, there were there are a few libraries that allows us to use it without extensive coding from our side. And uh, probably the first one is Histrix. Uh, it actually another library that were designed in Netflix uh, and now it is a part of Spring uh, which uh, implements oh sorry 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 which implements uh, this pattern another one is Fane it is more high level and it uses hit Histrix under the hood uh, to implement this pattern and provide you with some techniques for example how to react on uh, when your breaker becomes open and another uh, uh, library that i would like to mention here is resilience for uh, for j it's also implementations of uh, the circuit breaker pattern but uh, how it differs from this heat streaks and fan is that it uses lambda and is like re uh, designed as uh, for mainly for reactive applications so if you have this kind of applications, uh, probably it is worth to look uh, for resilience for J here. Uh, okay, let's carry on. 
uh, beside of that, uh, we have we have another techniques which technique which is really uh, I don't know really familiar to all of uh, Java programmers mainly, uh, and it's about uh, like it calls failure obvious computing. Actually, you should familiar with it. It is about our uh, like try and catch, and uh, uh, this is. Uh, Let's call it that this uh, actually failure obvious computing here is called because it's not applied only for Java. If actually, if it would be true only for Java, it would be called try catch, but it actually works for many, many different languages um, like which have no, uh, have no such constructions. They have another uh, mechanism for this, but what actually does uh, you have your code here and you try to and you make it uh, resisting to any issues that might happen here uh, with uh, you mark this block in some way and then you handle error which uh, appears in it actually uh, on one hand uh, this sounds really simple but actually when we imagine a code when we have to let's say try and catch every line of our actually business code, it would become a nightmare. And actually in a big scale, these things uh, really complicates the understanding of the code, the tracing of the code, the finding bugs and things like that. And therefore uh, this uh, not actually the best technique. And, uh, but in general, in general, it makes it can make our code really, really uh, sustainable, and uh, to and to resist many, many faults. Maybe in the case of Java, yes, everything that is not related to Java machine itself probably can be handled with this technique, but the price still is really great. Okay. Okay. Let's go on. And another technique that we have, but I called it exotic techniques, but uh, because of, first of all, it is, uh, we, I never, for example, face it in uh, my life, but, and this is very uh, exhaustive, let's say techniques. It requires really, really, really uh, a lot of, uh, resources, a lot of works, but it uh, makes our application very sustainable, extremely sustainable. Uh, how it works? Actually, we start uh, doing our tasks and do it with, first of all, the, the several instances does this. And another thing is that several instances or algorithms here does it in different way. And after our task completes, uh, we actually compare the output and evaluate which is the correct one. On one hand, it is, uh, sounds like a really not realistic uh, behavior, but in general, when you need your application or your system to be uh, super fault tolerant and uh, super sustainable, this actually works. And uh, such, uh, such uh, let's say, uh, such technique is used for aircraft programs, for uh, spacecraft programs, for uh, different, I don't know, robots or any other crucial systems that first of all, they have to work in real time and the second uh, of and the second they are like autonomous so you cannot easily right like restart them you cannot easily um, i don't know like uh, make a backup or bring a backup uh, so uh, they are implemented in such a way uh, what it uh, the price of all this is obvious yes so uh, for example imagine that you have let's say 
10 different functions and three ways to implement for each function. So how much it, how much it will take of you? It will uh, just like increase your work three times. Yes. And uh, if to take into account kind of the different combinations, it can bring things even more complicated, but uh, what you uh, receive in return is extremely, extremely sustainable application, which would ideally never fold because it will, it will always uh, be in good state or in appropriate state, okay? Again, this is kind of very exotic techniques. Uh, I mean, exotic uh, techniques for average programmer, but yes, actually I would like to say that hardware for our computers and uh, many other uh, like uh, electronic or digital devices, they also use this kind of techniques for within, the, within, uh, within themselves. So, after we explored uh, the techniques we had and understand how to make our application uh, fault tolerant, actually, you may think that it is not much left to say, but I would like to uh, say that uh, the, we have another one topic uh, to cover. And this topic is about uh, how to model the faults. Actually, why we need to model them? And I think the answer uh, on one hand can be that this is not so important, but I would like you, I would like to disagree with you and say that it is really, really important because uh, it would allow us uh, to understand how we are going to react to the fault and see actually how we are going to react the fault before, before the actual fault happened. And uh, first of all, let's start when we just designing our system. Uh, so on uh, when we designing our system and actually we do not have the system uh, like anywhere, we cannot touch it, we cannot use it. Uh, we still can think about uh, how to do it uh, fault tolerant. And uh, uh, actually there is a special techniques for this. So the first thing here is to define the list of potential fault. Uh, what this can be the list. This list can be anything that you understand yourself based on your experience. This is something that, for example, customers uh, of previous systems or subject matter expert can advise you that, um, I don't know, like, for example, I don't know, like your system should deal with when user provide wrong uh, credit card number or things like that. Uh, so you uh, gather all these scenarios and uh, to uh, and uh, for each uh, of these cases or this scenario, you create such a uh, uh, simple diagram, but anyway, it is really. Uh, really useful and it consists of these several uh, components. Uh, so first of all, it is stimulus or the source of fault. For example, like uh, what can be the source of fault in case of our like users, user enters the wrong credit card number, just like that. Uh, then you have actually your system or your component uh, uh, actually, Beside of that, it contains uh, none of the information, but it just identifies the entity which is uh, uh, which faces this um, this issue, and the entity which actually is going to deal with this issue. For example, if uh, this would be entire our internet shop, it would be entire our internet shop. If this is a card service, this actually means that our card service is going to deal with uh, the situation when user enters the wrong card number. If this is our database, 
Yes, the database would deal with user faces, their own card number and things like that. Uh, another important things, and uh, it is uh, not, uh, cannot be omitted is the measurement. Uh, what, what actually this measurement is? The measurement is, is how to identify your fault. For example, uh, some faults, uh, let's say like out of memory or things like that, they are easy to identify, but some are not. Uh, there are different evidence of this and there are different, uh, uh, different cases and like many things can happen. And the many ways the system have to react on it and therefore this measurements actually will say how you identify that this is actually this fault and for example you don't have to restart your server when user enters the wrong card number i think you get my point yeah so uh, and the last one but probably the most important one is how you are going to react, how your system or entity or component is going to react on the situation it faced. So actually uh, when you have uh, listed such a things for all your, uh, for not for all your, but for crucial components of your systems, uh, maybe for entire systems and you gathered all this scenario, this actually would give you a good evidence of uh, how your system would deal with uh, fault you with the faults you identifier, which uh, components are responsible for what in case of any fault, how will you deal with this and um, when you do did this, uh, let's say precisely and correctly it will bring you a very good understanding of uh, what your system should do and actually how to implement each components that have to be sustainable in different situations. Okay, great. Uh, so let's carry on. Uh, another thing is how to model faults when you actually implement implementing the system. Uh, when you implementing the system, probably you have uh, the whole system, but with not full, uh, but with not full functionality, or you have uh, only a parts of the system that are not assembled or not interact with each other, but still you have anything, some things you can, uh, some things you can perform uh, to ensure that your components or entire system remains default tolerant and here there are some techniques that can that can be applied and have to be applied and actually this mainly is about testing and uh, first of all when you want your system to be sustainable on implementation phase i really uh, recommend you to use and uh, introduce if you haven't had this before the stress testing or the load testing and actually this will give you an understanding of how your system behaves or how your system performs under the load which is more than usual load of the system so when you for example do a load testing and your system is designed for thousand users uh, maybe it's not worth to do every time but maybe one in five times just uh, just put 10000 users uh, uh, work workload on your uh, sorry not workload but just load of 10000 users for your system and see how it behaves and uh, probably you will get insight of how your system sustainable is what is actually a peak of uh, load it can use what is the throughput, how it is affected within the scales and many things like that. Uh, another system, another uh, type of testing you should can perform, it is destructive testing. Uh, actually, what the destructive testing is, the destructive testing is that uh, is testing uh, that uh, a bit of uh, as it said, is a big destructive, and this allows you to for how you can simulate this. Uh, you can, for example, turn off the database, turn off the cord, uh, I don't know, like switch off the computer and things like that. 
put the wrong config and actually all these things uh, will allow you to understand uh, how your system behaves in when some actual fault happens yes uh, and how it would behave in unexpected situation definitely my <laughs> kind of propositions uh, about the destructive testing they are not applied to probably not applied to your real world systems and uh, you know this is very specific to every product you are working on but if uh, for example your customer want your want its program to be really sustainable deal with with many unexpected situations, this is something that you uh, should perform, okay? Uh, another thing, it is degradation testing. Uh, and it is sometimes uh, this can be treated as part of destructive testing, sometimes is not. And actually, they are really close to each other, but with some difference. The degradation testing here uh, mostly uh, concentrated on uh, uh, how your system would behave from uh, the performance pers perspective when uh, you uh, turn it off some uh, like its components. Let's imagine that you have, uh, again, let's imagine that you have uh, several database instances and you turn, uh, let's say all of them but one. And, uh, and this would be kind of degradation testing, yes? And it will allow you to see how your system under load would behave when only one database instance is available. And maybe in the, this case, will give you some clue of probably to maybe add caching, maybe add caching in process caching, or maybe add external caches or things like that, or maybe, I don't know, like um, create a feature that would limit the number of sessions uh, that your users can create. Many things that can be applied here, but actually this degradation testing, it focuses on how your system is, how your system performance is uh, behaves when uh, kind of uh, some its part becomes unavailable or its throughput is really reduced. And another thing uh, that is uh, really important, it is recovery testing. What is recovery testing? It the testing of how your system recovers from your fault. Uh, if you remember previously, we were talking that, for example, if you uh, have if you have um, several instances of the server and one is down and all the request redirects to another, then you need to synchronize this test. Actually, this recovery testing is about similar things. So it would allow you to understand how your system restore its states, restore the state after the fault, uh, how long it takes to bring everything back to work. Uh, at all, can you recover your system or not? Because uh, you know uh, this might happen that when you de design it, the, your system to be recovering, but you never try it in real life, it can be a surprise for you. Okay, uh, let's go. Uh, how to model your fault when you already have the working system? It's another one good question, because, uh, for example, uh, usually our systems, they are not kind of just installed and forget. It requires usual maintenance, the maintenance of infrastructure, the maintenance of software, uh, different new features introduces, uh, different technologies or frameworks are replaced, and all things like that happens all the time. Uh, and so uh, how to understand that your system is still sustainable uh, and uh, there is a thing, uh, I don't know where it was introduced, but I really like this uh, phrase, this term, it is chaos engineering. Actually, you know, you see that they even uh, have uh, their kind of article in Wikipedia, and they uh, have their really big, really big number of uh, techniques of how to simulate the house and understand how this house 
actually affects your system, okay? So uh, what is the idea here? The idea here is that on your leaf systems, uh, leaf system, uh, some failures are simulated that gives you uh, understanding and clue of how your system behaves. And actually this, uh, ideally this would make you to uh, apply some steps or to do something about it when your when the results in unsatisfied, for example, uh, how to deal when you have your API gateway broken. Okay, uh, this actually means that uh, some some let's say set of services becomes unavailable. Some set of services becomes uh, not working and things like that. And you need to deal somehow with this and what you are going to do. And uh, actually, there are many, many, many scenarios of what can go wrong. And uh, actually, some of them, most of them are like specified here, but I would like to just extract the ones that probably would be most more interesting for us. Uh, the most famous one, one is the house monkey. This is the special tool. And I think uh, probably you know it, uh, what actually it does. It uh, goes through your services and turn them in random order for some random time or pick, pick them up in random order and random times. And actually what it gives you, it gives you to understand how your, for example, auto scaling works, uh, how, uh, for example, when service is unavailable, how your API gateway works uh, when it thinks that service is still available and things like that. Another uh, thing, it is Byte Monkey. What is Byte Monkey? Byte Monkey, it is uh, the same tool, but for GVM. It randomly uh, throws the null pointer from your code, uh, changes uh, different uh, numbers, and performs things like that. And uh, by this, it allows you to understand, for example, how thoroughly uh, you put try and catches into different situation within your code and how to explore it. Uh, another one thing, it is how smash. Uh, it is another one uh, chaos tool uh, and it works for Kubernetes and it actually does the same. It turn off the pod, turn off the roads, I don't know, like make some hosts unavailable and things like that to understand how your Kubernetes infrastructure would, uh, would uh, recover from this, uh, how it would deal, how it will still continue to operate or not with this. And actually, Another one thing, it is the disaster recovery simulation. Uh, the difference between this uh, house engineering and disaster recovery simulation, it is, uh, in, it is uh, really big. And if here ever something is happens under the hood and you are not directly, uh, let's say, manages this, this is the really manage manageable procedure. So, and how it happens usually on some, let's say, sort of, uh, on some period of time, I don't know, like Saturday evening or Friday evening or things like that, when your system is uh, not on under the load or not many uh, users use your system. Uh, you just start, you just simulate the disasters and see how the recovery happens. You, Mm, uh, you get some measures, understand how, for example, how much it took from, from database to recovery, how much it took from all servers to restart, how much it took uh, for, for example, for them uh, to connect to API gateway and that API gateway is um, register it and start to operating how your services all are connected together uh, after recovery and all these things they are measured these measurements are written analyzed and such procedure is performed actually there is one good example for this is this is this facebook storm this is actually internal facebook project but uh, what they do they um 
demonstrates its results on the, the corresponding page. And what they do uh, for some time, they just uh, like turn off for some time the entire segment of Facebook and see how it is being recovered. Uh, actually, that's all I wanted to tell you about this time. And so if there are any questions, any thoughts,